Hello everyone, I am Saurabh and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's talk. We are joined by Dr. Eduardo Garcia Padilla, a postdoctoral researcher from Professor Guanchichu's group. He will be presenting on global kinetic thermodynamic responses. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Garcia Padilla. Thank you for the kind introduction. And today I'm really excited to be presenting the derivation and also the application of the function that governs the global kinetic thermodynamic responses of a chemical process. Now, what is a kinetic thermodynamic response? For a given reaction family, the energy barriers often change with the reaction energies. And so, if one makes a reaction more thermodynamically favorable, it is usually observed that the reaction rate increases. This is in spite of the reaction rate being related to the transition state energy and not directly to the energy of the product. The extent of this response varies significantly depending on which specific reaction is being studied. Due to its importance, there have been several different models trying to explain this and find how it affects different reactions. The more well-known models are the Leffler equation, which links the energy barrier to the reaction energy in a linear way, and the Marcus equation, which links them as the intersection of two parabolas. However, there are problems with both models. The Leffler equation, for instance, is statistical in nature and constitutes a linear approximation to the underlying nonlinear pattern. This means the Leffler equation only really holds for a small range of reaction energies. The Marcus equation assumes that the reactants and the products distort symmetrically as the parabolas have the same amplitude. This makes the physical meaning of the response harder to interpret. Therefore, if we want to find a truly global model, we have to make it as general as possible. We have to use minimal assumptions, stemming only from the very definition of a chemical reaction, in order to make it inherently general. This also implies that the parameters would not arise from pure data fitting, and so their physical meaning can be understood from their role in the derivation. However, what do all chemical reactions have in common? One of the most fundamental properties of chemical reactions is that, given a barrier, all processes will have a reverse process associated. And the energy barrier of the reverse process is linked to the energy barrier of the forward process and the reaction energy. As we have a function that gives us the energy of the transition state from the reaction energy, we can write this relationship as shown. And therefore, differentiating with respect to the reaction energy shows interesting properties. In particular, for this given process, we can see that the function of the reverse process shows some symmetry with respect to the forward process. If we look at the gradients instead, we can see that they are both sigmoid curves that are displaced from the y-axis. But this is even more apparent with the curvature. The curvature of the function, giving the energy barrier for the forward process and the reverse process, is the same shape just reflected by the y-axis. And now with this symmetry we can know more about how the function grows. In order to think of this energy response, we have to think of the transition state as a function of the reactant and the product. And so it is very interesting to look at Hammond's postulate, which linked the position of a transition state, and thus its geometry, to the difference in energy between the reactant and the product. In particular, this leads to the transition state responding interpolatively to the intermediates. And so we can talk about an early transition state or a late transition state, depending on how thermodynamically favorable a reaction is. Therefore, one can see that this is smooth as a stabilization of either of the minima will stabilize the transition state, precisely because the factors stabilizing the transition state spreading from the minimum. Now, as the transition state resembles the minimum that is closest to it energetically, one can see what happens at the extreme, in which a reaction can be infinitely favorable. And so the transition state 
has to be infinitely close to the reactant. We can see that there must be something fundamental about the behaviour of the transition state at these extremes. When the transition state is infinitely early, it can only respond to the reactant, and so any change must be constant with respect to the reaction energy. We can show this as the value of the transition state energy at negative infinity, consisting exclusively of a pre-organization energy, which remains constant. Conversely, when the reaction is extremely endothermic, this reaction is fully decoupled from the reactant state. So in order to reach the product, one must at least overcome the reaction energy. However, any additional increase in energy to reach the transition state cannot depend on the reaction energy, and so must also be constant. And we can refer to this as the reorganization energy, which would be the minimum reorganization energy for an infinitely favorable process. By looking at both these things together, we can see that just by differentiating, the gradient will change from zero to one at the extremes. And so we now know the asymptotes of our first derivative of the function. In addition, we can see that the reorganization energy of this process must be the same as the pre-organization energy of the reverse process, as both processes are intrinsically linked in the way we had seen before. Let's consider an identity reaction. This is a reaction in which the reactant and the product are identical. There are many such examples, but here I show two of them a degenerate co-prearrangement and an identical SN2 reaction. Now, because the reverse and forward processes are the same, whichever function is relating the barrier to the reaction energy also has to be the same for both processes. If we now recall that the curvature of the forward process was the mirror image of that of the reverse process, seeing as the functions are the same, this means that the curvature itself is symmetric about the y-axis and reaches a maximum when the reaction energy is zero. Therefore, the gradient has to be oddly symmetric about its inflection point, which happens to be at zero. And because we know the gradient goes from zero to one, this inflection point has to have a value of 0 0.5 and zero. This means that for a perfectly symmetric reaction, the gradient at zero has to be 0 0.5. However, of course, many reactions are not symmetric. However, as the functions are related, we can see how the gradients are actually the same, but just displaced by some reaction energy. We can call this reaction energy EEQ for equivalence point. And we can see that if we moved both together by EEQ, they would be the same function. And so the parent function, once displaced, are the exact same function, just shifted vertically by some constant. Now, because we know the limits of both of these functions at positive and negative infinity, we can make those limits equal. And we can find that EQ is actually just the difference between the minimum pre-organization energy and the minimum reorganization energy. And this is how the asymmetry of our reaction can be defined. We have now derived many of the properties that the function must satisfy. As the underlying assumption is that Hammond's postulate must hold true, we can express this as all stabilizing factors at the transition state coming from either the reactant or the product. And this can be seen as a sum of exponentials, which is equal to one. The factors coming from the reactant side would be in the first exponential, separated by the activation energy of the forward process. Conversely, the factors coming from the product would be separated by the activation energy of the reverse process. Theta would capture how coupled the transition state is to each of the two minima. 
and because we know that the reverse barrier can be expressed as forward barrier minus reaction energy, we can re-express this and reach the equation of a perfectly symmetric system. Since we know that asymmetry can be accounted for simply by a displacement, EQ, and that there can be a constant minimum pre-organization energy, which we can call E-min, we can now reach the truly general form of the global kinetic thermodynamic response. We then demonstrated this in a number of reaction classes. The first one was the one to hydride shift on different vinyl copper cations. These can be easily modified. They are all very similar chemical species, and so the orbital makeup of the transition states and the minima is very, very similar across all of the different substrates that we studied. In addition, these reactions are quite synchronous, and so the Hammond postulate should hold significantly well. We calculated a relatively broad set of reactions to try to see the curvature through having a very broad range of reaction energies. The results showed that the curvature was indeed present. This allowed the determination of all three parameters, both for the potential energy and for the Gibbs free energy. For the potential energy, E min, the minimum pre-organization was found to be 12.5 kilocalories per mole, with EQ, the asymmetry, being 7.7 .7 kilocalories per mole, and theta having a value of just under 0.1 moles per kilocalorie. We also studied a model 5 exo cyclization, which should be much more challenging as it is catalyzed by a transition metal. It includes solvent effects, and most of the species involved are chemically much more complicated. In this case, the 25 examples we studied spanned over 30 kilocalories per mole in reaction energy, and the curvature was more gradual but still observable. And several conclusions could be extracted from this. In particular, no matter how favoured the reaction is, given similar substituents, one would always expect a minimum pre-organisation energy of 21 kilocalories per mole. This means that the initial complex will always be stable regardless of driving force, and so one would expect a significant energy input before reaching the transition state. On the other hand, the minimum reorganization energy, defined as E min minus EQ, is found to be negative. This means that the final product is not always a minimum, and if the reaction is disfavored enough, the final product would revert back to the reactant without any barrier. This gives very interesting insights for this reaction. In conclusion, we have derived the way in which a reaction barrier is connected to the reaction energy, and so how the kinetics respond to the thermodynamic changes in the process. This is a new approach to understand the transition state stabilization, and it is inherently general given that we start from the very definition of a barrier, followed by the principle of microscopic reversibility and the Hammond's postulate, and so should in principle be general to all synchronous reactions where Hammond's postulate holds. It reframes the linear approximation, as seen in the latter equation, as a local descriptor, some sort of tangent to this nonlinear function, and so e min, e q, and theta would cause there to be different gradients at different points, being the global descriptors, whereas the local tangent would be a local approximation. I would like to thank Dr. Quan Chi Chu, with whom I developed this work, for all of the very insightful discussions, as well as her group, the Max Planck Institute through Colin Fuashung, IUKMBD for the storage of all openly available computational data, and the Max Planck Gesellschaft for funding. Thanks to Dr. Eduardo Garcia Padilla for the excellent talk on global kinetic thermodynamic responses. If you like this session, Follow the synthesis workshop for more on synthesis and molecular design. See you next time.